I want to uh, uh, introduce David I a little bit, but I want to give you a little bit of background. I've known David for over 20 years, and um, David inspired me way, way back in the, in the early days uh, because he invented an entire career path that we now take for granted. And I swear that he only did it so that he could spend, uh, so that he could reduce his uniform to wearing tie-dye shirts and that he could spend all of his days just playing with cool technology and get paid for it. Uh, but uh, from my perspective, David really invented uh, the entire career path of developer evangelism and developer community. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce David I. Well, thanks for that introduction, Joe. I should say that there were evangelists before with Guy Kawasaki, Alon Rossman, and the guys at Apple in the Macintosh day. Before then, there were the Atari Wizards as well. But I, I think of myself more as a uh, cheerleader for developers. And uh, I started my career in college. I wrote my first program. It was a Fortran IBM 360 40. Uh, prime number generator, it's sort of like one of the first things you write in computer science. And then I switched immediately into personal computers, which at those times were 8 and 16-bit MIDI computers. And I spent my first eight years after college doing nothing but real-time assembly language programming with an assembler and a console, and that was about it. So then I started writing tools that we didn't, because we didn't have anything else, debuggers, linkers, and all sorts of things. And that was my work uniform on the left there, uh, back in 73 to 79, 80. Um, had an Apple II, had Atari 400s, 800s, 1600, 5200s, had VIC 20, Z80 processor boards. I went through Timex Sinclair. I used to play with anything that could have a personal computer that I could touch. I built my first kit computer, which was an MSI 8080 in 1974. Uh, with an Intel 8080 board and two 4K static RAM cards. It still works. It's in my office in Scotts Valley. I turn it on occasionally and key machine level programs in through the front panel switches, hit stop, reset, and start, and then the lights sort of blink on the LEDs. So that was what I do for sort of old fun. For the last 28 years, I've been involved in the developer tools business at our company which some of you will remember was named Borland International, then Inprise, then Borland Software, then Code Gear, and now we're part of Embarcadero Technologies, so hence the Embarcadero. And I still wear tie-dye, so uh, it's under there. Uh, and we do a lot of stuff. Cheerleading is an important thing. I love being here and in front of developers, talking about development. I'm language agnostic, even though we make you know products for with the Delphi Object Pascal language, C++, and we also have an HTML5 JavaScript PHP product called HTML5 Builder. Um, and we have our community and we partners and all of that stuff that we work on. But I'm really here to talk about the change in what it means to work with computers, to work with devices. We, we always have thought about a PC and a Mac and a server somewhere and a cloud infrastructure these days, but now we have all sorts of stuff. So up here on the desk table, I've got all sorts of different devices and we're gonna play with different ones of them. The good thing is that they're all programmable in some fashion. And this has been coming on for some time now as we've all seen it, right? We started with the world of, of Windows and Macintoshes and then the mobile devices of iPhone, iPad, and now the Android devices have come, lots of them. The Windows devices and servers and Linux servers are not going to go away. They're going to be around forever, just as there are IBM mainframes and there are all sorts of other Solaris boxes and Berkeley Unix boxes and other kinds of things. But when we think now about what we need to do as developers to program these different systems, we have in-dashboard car systems that we can build apps for. We obviously have the mobile systems where we can, uh, where we can Go away, Pebble. Okay. Oh, we have a wearable watch. This is a Pebble watch over here, and it's telling me that it's communicating back and forth. And that's just going to continue. I think this graphic 
which is made up, of, or infographic made up of, of results and platform surveys over the years, shows that at the early days of our industry, if you were around then, there was lots of diversity in the different kinds of hardware and software systems that we were using. VIC-20, Commodore 64, um, Amiga with great graphics that we used to play with all inside of a plywood box with a little red reset button. Then along came Intel and the 8088, 8086, and then we had MS-DOS, we had two interrupts that we had to care about, that was our API in 16 and 21, that was pretty cool. And then we started doing other things with graphics cards and so on. Then along came Windows. Before that, OS2, which Joe, we, we spent time with, and I spent time with it in the Borland time. But for, for about 30 years, it was really this Wintel, this Windows and Intel world that dominated everything that developers had to care about. And of course, big APIs and doing all sorts of things. And, and there were other systems we had to connect to. That's always the case, will always be the case. More recent time, uh, iOS with Apple and Android from Google have become, again, the dominant growth area and the use area for developers. This was, I, I, ca I used my phone to take a picture of this from CNBC. This was Q2 smartphone sales that showed just how fast Samsung and Android have moved into the space of when we think about these kind of mobile devices, whether they're tablets or phones. Here's an iPhone, here's a Galaxy S4, here's a Nexus 7, uh, here's an iPad 4, right? All these kinds of things. This was an infographic that came out uh, earlier this year from Comscore. It shows platform market share over time, right? So you could see that, that Android and Apple have grown over time and some of the other ones, like RIM, for example, and Microsoft, have dropped down. Of course, Microsoft is still a work in progress, right? They have their devices and they have their Windows phone system, but we're sort of in this pattern of wait and see in some ways, waiting for uh, the Nokia acquisition that'll happen next year sometime and for who's gonna be the next CEO of Microsoft. We can't, none of us can take our eyes off what it might mean in a Windows mobile world, because anything is possible. But of course, the biggest part in, uh, in iOS and Android, tablet sales versus, you know, when do the tablets take over from desktops? Where are the tablets going? I, one of my daughters doesn't have a PC or a desktop computer. She has an iPhone 5 and she has an iPad 4, and those are her computing devices. Now she's the theater director, so, you know, she doesn't need necessarily to write code and do all sorts of things. Uh, smartphones, I think it was in July of this year that smartphones passed feature phones in sales around the world. So the days of the feature phone with limited applications that were in there and some limited connectivity has changed dramatically and that trajectory will continue in the world of smart devices, smartphones, and so on. Now, this was Device Palooza and developer palooza, so that's the square, right? Devs and devs. Okay, so devices, I'm not gonna rant on stage like Steve Ballmer did about developers, I'm just gonna say it's all about devices, devices, devices today, and what you might wanna do with them. And of course, this is a device. This is a MacBook Pro circa last year. This is a Samsung Slate. This guy here, I shouldn't move it around too much because we'll disconnect things. Samsung Slate, Series 7 has an accelerometer built in. It's got an orientation sensor, it's got an ambient light sensor, so it, it has some of the things, and of course it can be a tablet, or you can plug it in a docking station, use a keyboard, and it's got a virtual keyboard and so on. So it, it's almost one of these, what some people are calling hybrid or two-in-one device, right? It's a desktop, it's a tablet, it's a game machine, whatever it might be. And then we have all sorts of other stuff up here that we think about. What about home automation? What about automobiles and all the things that you can do? Ford and General Motors have developer programs. How cool is that? Now, what do you want to do to program your car or things in your car? I mean, the car is made up of all sorts of processors and sensors, and if there's APIs, you can have fun. 
with your car. I have a Toyota Prius, and of course, I go to the Prius hack site where I can learn how to hack into the, the display that's in my Prius and use the buttons for all sorts of things, except for playing games while you're driving. They seem to not want you to do that while you're going. So digital health, uh, you know, here's uh, blood sugar, monitoring blood sugar, continuously monitoring, plugging it into your computer. This is blood pressure, so when I get too excited about all this great stuff, right, here's a USB blood pressure. These are all becoming Wi-Fi and or Bluetooth, so you don't have to connect them through a cable. They're just there all the time. I have an Arduino board at home, and my, one of my daughters, for a Christmas gift, gave me a kit to solder together. It's a breathalyzer. And it plugs into the Arduino board, and then I can connect it to my PC. So while I'm giving a future keynote, not this one, I can be drinking alcohol and measuring my sobriety level in real time. And you can watch it on the screen. Not today. We're not doing that world. Um, some lights, these are Philips Hue lights. These, uh, these are LED lights that are directly addre accessible, dr addressable, and we can change the patterns of the light and intensity for the whole broad spectrum. Now, it's cool for light shows at home. You can hook it up to music. Uh, it has a bridge box that's over here. You can hook 50 of these $60 light bulbs to each bridge box, and you can then um, put as many bridge boxes as you want, so you can have a huge LED array. Let's just uh, bring up the Philips Hue app. Let's go over to my Mac and turn on AirPlay. And so there's that. So here's the Philips Hue app. And again, there's also a program interface through HTTP and REST, and you send JSON packets, and you can get JSON packets back from each of these devices. The cool thing is, yeah, we can put colors and we can change the colors, and, and maybe that's cool or not. We can go and choose some different colors. So for example, if I want the lights to all be red, uh, let's go to Kathy. We can ungroup the lights and individually address them. So if we want one light to be sort of orange and this one to be green and this other one to be blue, right? Now, that seems like fun, right? And you can write programs, you could have a web app that's built in PHP and it can send HTTP requests to the bridge box and, and JSON packets to this thing, or you can write native code to do it. Um, the reason I bought these not only for demoing purposes is my wife suffers from seasonal affective disorder in the wintertime, where it's dark more hours than it is light. Because these are full spectrum, I can program them to simulate the sunrise earlier so she can get to work as a Montessori school teacher. Now, they have clocks, there's an alarm clock for about $200 that does the same thing. But I've got phones and computers, and this starter kit with the bridge box and the three light bulbs was only $200 from Amazon.com. So I figure I get not only light shows, but I can program, no matter where I am on the planet Earth, the right sunrise for my wife or anybody else who wants uh, that kind of behavior, right? And also it's just cool to be able to program and send JSON to the, to the lights and have them do something. I, I don't know, maybe that's just me being me. I don't know. Okay. Um, the next one here is, is uh, in home automation, this is a front door lock. It looks like a regular door lock. You know, it's got the buttons and the thing. It's got a key. That's always important in case batteries run out. Oh, Kelly, I probably moved that, I'm sorry. Hopefully it's still okay. So now it's the, this is, uh, this is from Mi Casa Verde. This is a Linux box. This is called the Vera Light box, and it's got Linux in it, and it's connected to the network, and then it's got an API and an SDK, and I have an app here that runs on iOS. There's an Android app, and you can do it from your PC or Mac as well. You can also do it through a browser interface. You could have, your browser interface running in the cloud somewhere, and as long as it can get to the Verilite box, it can then control your house. Now, here we'll just do something simple. For example, uh, oh, let's connect to it. Come on, you can do it. Okay. And then we'll go to locks and the quick set door lock. It'll send a message, and this is how exciting it gets, right? When you're a device 
and developer. I just locked my front door. Now, that's pretty simple. I could have just gone to the door and switched the switch, right? But think about it this way. I've got devices either in my car or in my personal world that know things about location, for example. So as I get closer to my house within whatever proximity I want to choose, I can have an app that I build that says, hey, I'm approaching my house, open my garage door, unlock the deadbolt to my kitchen, right? turn on the stereo, turn on the lights, turn on the coffee pot, um, turn on the popcorn maker, whatever. And there are tons of these devices that are out there at Home Depot and everywhere else. Uh, they're either Z-Wave, this is a Z-Wave system where it does radio frequency from the, the Verilite box, Linux box, to the devices. So in here there's batteries and a daughter board that's listening, all secure through the security code. And so I can now program my world or think about if I'm doing security access systems, do something else. And in the past, those were all very proprietary systems, right? Health monitoring, of course, you have to do a lot of stuff when you're involved in digital health uh, for, for, for those worlds and patient information and other things. There are lots of different audio and video devices. I mean, we've got two cameras, right? Frontward, backward facing. This is an older one. No, it's got two cameras. This got two cameras. I think this, this is last year's uh, version of the Nexus 7 by Asus, so it's only got a forward facing camera. The new one this year, the 2013 edition. And with that, you want to play audio, you want to record audio, you want to play video, capture video, uh, you want to you know, the stupid human trick, which is to turn on your light, right, to make it a flashlight so there's a torch mode. There's all these different interfaces that you can directly access in the devices when you query to see what devices are available. There's also trillions of sensors in the world. We think about sensors as motion sensors, for example, and those kinds of things, you know, pressure sensors and so on. All over the world, people are putting traffic speed sensors, right? So imagine you're building a logistics app for UPS or something. The GPS system will tell you, hey, there's congestion here, do you want me to reroute you? But think about changing the routing pattern of a delivery person based on the, the road sensors that are telling you information, how you could improve the productivity of the delivery systems by doing real-time programming and real-time monitoring of the sensors that we know because we all drive and how to get around if you know local secrets or if you know the rerouting algorithm that someone else gives you. So all the different things, biometric, ambient light, all these things are available to us. Just in this iPhone alone, there are how many sensors? Orientation sensor, compass, so there's, there's, you know, there's the cameras, there's the light. Uh, we could use the light in the camera to take blood pressure Right? by just shining the light into the skin and then reading the, the, the movement of blood inside of an extremity. So you know, when you start thinking about how many sensors you have, motion sensor and so on, um, the kinds of apps you might build or how you might hook it into your infrastructure of the systems that you're building. I won't give away my favorite secret, but uh, I think there's a world of next generation experience when you go to clubs and nightclubs with dance music and so on, or at Disneyland or some amusement park. Uh, there's all sorts of things you might think about. If you make the assumption that everybody has at least one smart device uh, on their person whenever they're going. I visited a, a hospital in Korea that's working on a plan for the year 2020 and they're starting the development now. When you walk into this huge medical center, if you don't have a smart device, phone, smart device with location, they will give you one. Because it turns out they will save time and money by having it route you to all the places you need to go in this huge medical center to get your x-rays done, ultrasound done, blood taken, and they know what the waiting times are so they can reroute you dynamically through this massive medical center so you're not waiting and some facility is not being underutilized unless it's a test that has to be done in a certain order. And again, the logic can be programmed for that. That's pretty cool. Now, what else can we do? Uh, let's go back here, and I didn't try this demo, but it should work. 
At home, I have a Nest programmable thermostat, and so it's 68 degrees in my hallway right now, and if I want to, I can turn the heater on. So I know one of my daughters is at home, so it, she can, maybe she's a little cold, so now it's heating, right? So that's done either through a browser or through a smart device. Nest has, has a way to do automation like this, but they don't have an SDK yet. Well, they just announced that next year they'll have a developer's SDK. Because nice, one of the nice things about Nest, besides it turns on your heating and cooling, is that it has a motion sensor. So when I walk down the hall by it, it lights up because it senses that I'm there, human presence motion. It also uses that to know if there's anybody in the house so that it can set an away mode. So it, and you set a temperature when nobody's in the house that you want the house to go to. Well, imagine it's another intruder alert device it, that's separate from maybe if you have some kind of, of uh, lock and security system, will the robbers think about the thermostat as another human movement sensor uh, in the system? Maybe not. So having those APIs help us do a lot more. Now, other devices, we did that, we did the lights. Um, okay, let's do the leap motion. So now, when we talk about user interfaces, the people who have Xboxes and Wii devices and so on, think about uh, all little devices and things that they have. Of course, I have an Xbox 360 and I have a Kinect device and we then hook Kinect device up to Windows as well so we can do all sorts of gestures, move to the next page on a document, move to the next tab on a tab-based application and so on. Uh, Leap Motion has this, this device, it's this big, right? And it, uh, it creates a 3D sphere of interface that you can do things with. So let's wave the hand over the device and then remove them, and now it'll start going. This is one of the demos that ships with it. So we can go in here and we can just go into the field, right, and, and interact with it. And again, it's projecting a 3D sphere around that device. So think about the user interface that you might do with, with gestures and applications and so on, instead of the trackpad or moving the mouse around. And this demo also has kind of cool music. So here's the 3D sphere, so you can reach around and around the side. And it has a range about this big. Now, HP has licensed the Leap Motion technology. So imagine this is in every HP notebook and tablet in the future, just built in, and what you can do. Samsung Galaxy uses the camera, right? So you can do gestures along the camera side to, uh, to interact and move again as you're waving through pages, for example. So let's, uh, let's do another one. And you get down to the digit world, digits on your hands, so you can even program my, minute movements. So here's, you know, peace baby, right? And, and high five. And so you get that level of control through the user interface of what you might do in your application, right? For like a $100 device or be built into the different Things. There's a whole SDK, so you can use it for games, for specialized applications, moving through spreadsheets, moving through pages on a website, whatever it might be. So again, when we start thinking about what are all these different devices that are cool looking hardware, but then if they have an API and an SDK, what more we can do with them. So this one is the last, I think, thing we'll do here. It's a, it's a coloring program. And what it does is it says, if you go into part of the area, that's where you move your, you can move your finger around, and if you go further, then you can start drawing, right? And I'm not a finger painting, because I haven't done finger painting since, uh, since kindergarten, so. Uh, and then we can do lots of fingers as well. Now, I also have touch notebooks, of course, so in some of them are two touch, four touch, 10 finger touch. Uh, the trackpad on the Mac, you know, you do two finger gestures, right, left, if you turn gestures on. Uh, this is the Samsung Series 7, uh, is a touch-based system that can do 10 touch. So, um, again, the kinds of things we can think about doing in the world of the devices of the future and the notebooks and computers of the future. Uh, Z-Wave, uh, if we bring up one of the machines uh, on the Mac side, 
There's lots of different home automation. I showed you the lights. We can change those if we want. Uh, Z-Wave seems to be the most predominant alliance of a lot of devices. Zigbee is another alliance, so you can check those out. Nest, it's a cool, it's just plug replaceable for your current and programmable or non-programmable thermostats. And then that's the Philips Hue lights that you can play with. Um, digital health is another big area, as we know. Uh, healthcare spending, and we're in this world of Affordable Care Acts and other things. There's a lot of people looking to digital health as it relates to their personal devices, as well as some of these additional devices that can be connected through an API or through an interface. So things like, as we're aging in this world, the human population, memory training. People are using the, these devices and such for that. Uh, for, of course, recording information about number of steps you take and blood pressure over time, other kinds of things. Um, we can go in here and uh, there's a, a company called Full Power Technologies that has an app that, uh, if I can remember where I put it, that's the, uh, okay, here. Um, that uses all the sensors it can, of course, the motion sensor to do number of steps and things like that. Um, here, I haven't turned on the stepper, but I can go here and here's the other one, heart rate. Again, it just says, you know, put your, let's start it and put our hand over here. We can see what uh, my resting heart rate is. Well, sometimes it, it's a little touchy when I hold it the right way or not. But again, it's just using the torch mode and the camera. So using all the activities and all the things we might do in the digital health world, is another part of what these devices, beyond just us all sitting at desktops pounding on the computers. Now maybe there'll be sensors there. Um, I've seen some prototype smartphones that have environmental sensors built in, temperature, pressure, humidity, and even carbon dioxide level. So imagine if every smartphone in the future is not only a local weather station, but is reporting carbon dioxide levels on a billion devices, smartphones around the planet Earth, right? That would pr be pretty cool to be able to measure what was going on and where the emissions are coming from using location-based sensor and try to figure out what to do about it. So lots of things in that space. This is a slide here on the Mac that I took from Full Power Technologies where they, they identify some of the different sensors that are already in the devices today and what you might do with them. Obviously, you can sense light through the camera and through the ambient light sensor. How bright is it? How dark is it? Their touch-based systems, GPS, and so on. They have built-in microphones, so you can... Uh, one of the 24 by 7 app parts that they do is, do you snore? Maybe you have sleep apnea. Do you talk in your sleep? Do you roll around in your sleep? Or you have restless leg motion? Because the accelerometers, because of the microphone, all put together. I put this up here, too, because the CEO of Full Power Technologies is Philippe Kahn, uh, who gave me my first job at Borland in 1985. Um, but more, it's about thinking in terms of not just, hey, I can put some customer data on the screen and maybe look at the orders of the customers or connect to salesforce.com. I can actually think in terms of what else is available on the device and how can I take advantage of it as a developer to solve a problem or record some kind of activity. Of course, we always think about the sort of standard stuff, like, uh, let's go uh, here. So this is a sample application. It just uh, called ShareSheet, and what it does is it lets you take a photo, right? And so now we've got the, you're out there in the dim, right? So there you are over here. And we can say, yeah, that one's okay, we'll use it. And then because on our applications, we can share that image that we took with different applications by saying what applications have rights to get at bitmaps or photos. So we can go here and just post this on Facebook or Twitter, and then it will do the integration is done for me in the device through the API. Now, ShareSheet came in with uh, iOS 5.0 and beyond. So I can just post that picture, and now there's a picture there. I can go over to this Samsung device uh, let's see, go over to, uh, let's see, okay, uh, go over to uh, the Samsung, or the Slate, sorry, 
and uh, same thing. So if I go over, uh, lots of apps, always the case, share sheet. So same application, right? We'll shoot this side of the audience, so we'll take a photo, and, uh, and then it's that was a little bright over here. I'm not fighting with the, uh, those lights on the stage that are beating down on me, right? And then I'll save it, and then I'll go and share it. So now on, the, on this is uh, the Android device, I've got all sorts of apps that have the intents of how I can share. So I go to Facebook and I say here, go to Facebook and say ZenCon Keynote. And I can't type, so, you know, we'll get there somehow. And then we post that, we could add the GPS. And again, that's part of the hooking into the Facebook app, but I could also just upload, come on, face, Facebook, post, or not. Oh, I know what's happening, sorry. It was still in recognition mode, so it'll go there. And then, as far as we're concerned, the, the pictures are there. Now, of course, I could build an app that uses the location system and uses the, uh, the camera and maybe do an audio recording and send that to some of your own device. And there it goes. So now it's going up to Facebook. All right. Um, so we have lots of fun stuff that we can do in the devices. And we'll get to some more of these in, in a little bit. At the same time, we're developers and we love our tools, just like contractors and construction workers have their big toolboxes. There are lots of tool choices that we can that we can use. First, there's lots of languages we can choose to employ, whether they're native code languages, managed code, or script and dynamic languages. We have all that ability. Most of the devices give you APIs that at least at some level, whether it's HTTP, REST, JSON, you can get to from different languages. We have lots of architectures, devices, form factors, screen resolution, orientations that we have to think about. Hopefully, the tooling can do some of that for us, and the operating system does some of that. That's pretty cool. Multi-tier, you might have it inside your infrastructure. You need some business logic sitting in a server somewhere, written in whatever language you want. You might have something in a cloud running on an Amazon web service. I've got several instances running on a AWS myself, and I've got those in Windows and Linux uh, instances that are running. And then I can connect to them. I have elastic IP addresses for each of those virtual machines so that I can connect to them. And then, of course, we have this whole service world. You know, there's services for everything. You hear the term backend as a service. I can use Amazon services, Microsoft services, IBM services. Google has tons of services. The great thing is a lot of them are accessible through some API, especially through HTTP REST, JSON, and either JSON or XML as the formats, for example. So having a service orientation as part of the solution, whether we're doing desktop or server side or device side, we can rely on all of those other pieces that are available and put it all together inside of the application. Now, if you want to go with a certain vendor's platform and tools, then you're sort of in that world, you can use Xcode on the Macintosh from Apple, right? You can use Android Studio and or Eclipse to work with Google and Android. And if you want to do everything Windows, Windows Server and Windows Phone, you can use C-sharp.net, C++, and Microsoft's tool set of Visual Studio. If you're interested and you like leveraging the technologies of the web, then you've got languages like, or markup language like HTML5, programming language, JavaScript, uh, CSS3 and, and all sorts of other things that you can employ to get the work done, or other scripting languages, Python and so on, Groovy, there's lots of different ones. Each of them have their benefits. Of course, if you want the best experience on a specific platform, usually that platform vendor, usually, is gonna, is gonna do a really good job for you. But they only produce tools for that platform, right? You, you can't use Xcode easily to generate applications for Android, right? So you gotta make some choices. And if you wanna get to all these different devices and their APIs and their operating systems and, and the hardware underneath, then you might have to write multiple sets of code. Now on the, and again, choose your language, right? Objective-C for iOS, C++ for iOS and Microsoft, 
and OS X, Java for Android. Android also comes with a native SDK, so you can use C++ or some other compiled language if you want to do Android development. So there's two choices, a Java SDK and a native SDK that you can choose. So again, lots of choices. Sometimes you'll have to use multiple tools and multiple languages for multiple environments and targets. Now on the web side, there again are tools. You can use things like PhoneGap and other technologies that let you take parts of your application and package it up for the device, right? Package it up. The nice thing is iOS and Android come with WebKit, which gives you not only web technologies, but a JavaScript interpreter and can deal with CSS and so on. So that's pretty nice, but sometimes we learn that optimized native code just will do a better job depending on the kind of application and how much user interaction happens with it. Uh, Facebook originally built their Facebook app for iOS and Android in HTML5 and JavaScript and then rewrote it in native code because it just didn't perform well. If it's simple interactions, then you could probably use just about anything. Now, I'm a big believer in the internet, so don't get me wrong if I say this the wrong way. I believe in the internet. I believe the internet is the ultimate API for doing all sorts of things. I, I like using the technologies and protocols of the internet. I just don't believe that every application should run in a browser. All right? And we've seen the three, what I call the three generations so far of applications for at least these mobile devices. When I first got my first iPhone, most of the applications I had, I had to use the browser. And that was not a very good experience because of the form factor, screen size, so on. Or the, they were applications that, but they, they still felt like they were browser with a little skin on the front. The next generation was what I'll call the browser container application, where it was an application and it looked kind of native. But again, it was still using some browser underneath, and you could see that in the way it behaved. And then the third generation is all the native code apps, and you, you've probably seen that yourself. You know, a simple banking app, probably a browser container with PhoneGap or some other packaging technology. But a lot of their apps now that are just high performance because you're doing lots of interactions. But I believe in TCP, HTTP, HTTPS, I believe in REST, I believe in, in JSON, I believe in XML and all of those pieces. What I don't believe, and it's my personal opinion, I don't like stuff getting between me and what I want to do, that I have to rely on somebody else, whether that's a virtual machine or some other thing. If, I, if it's a static library I have the source code to and I can link it in, that's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. But I can use script languages, managed languages, that's all right. You can make that choice. And, and this is sort of a way to visualize this when it gets down to the hardware, right? Well, I guess these tie-dye does come out eventually. Can't hide it. Um, so a lot of processors are ARM processors these days uh, on the devices. Of course, now some companies are starting to ship Intel Atom-based devices running Android because you can have Android on Intel processors. But it, the predominant numbers are still ARM v6, ARM v7, and so three choices again. Native code, everything's linked and optimized binary like, like, like we've done for years, and it has a native execution performance, and it has access to everything in the hardware and the operating system. Second way is to go through some kind of JavaScript middleware interpreter or the virtual machine. So on Android, the Dalvik VM, and again, you can go and have at it with uh, different languages that generate IL and pass it along, and then eventually it executes on the device. Uh, we learned early on in some of the early mobile devices, Motorola and so on, people were using Java. It just didn't perform well. The processors were slow. The memories were small. Now, you're going to get ready to move to the world of uh, mobile if you haven't already moved there. Uh, we've looked at what people's success rates were and some, what some of the problems were. And the first one that we found is you can't just take a desktop application and slap it on a device unless it's a, you know, a, a, a retina display iPad or a Galaxy Tab 10, you know, 9.5 inch diagonal, 10 inch diagonal. In that world, you might be able to fit everything in. But the metaphors are different, too. You may or may not have a keyboard. I have a Logitech Bluetooth keyboard for my iPad, right? It has nice, it protects the screen. 
Uh, my Slate has a Bluetooth keyboard. But in some cases, you don't have a Bluetooth keyboard or you don't want to carry one around. So you're in a touch-based and gesture-based world, which is different than a mouse and menu-based world, right? Windows and Mac, they have mice support and they have menus that pull down from the top or however they pop up. On these other devices, there's no menus. Or menus are really just button bars, toolbars, right? And you scroll through them. Or you can simulate a pull-down menu. I don't, I've never seen a popular app that has a pull-down menu on a device, right? Maybe you've seen some. Usually it's some kind of button bar that you slide vertically, horizontally scroll through to select different options. Most of the time what you see is tabs at the bottom, a multi-tab, four tabs, five tabs, or the more button on the tabs on the bottom. Part of that is because on these devices, the keyboard, virtual keyboards, grow up from the bottom, right? So your view is oftentimes down at the bottom. Now on Windows and Mac, we might put our tab notebook, look on Windows, the tab notebook, is that the tabs are at the top, right? Because you're always looking up because that's where the menu is. So you always look to move through the different parts of your application versus popping up multiple forms. You know, modal dialog boxes on Android, there's no such thing. You put up a message window, that's fine but uh, there's no notion as it relates to what we would think about in a Windows world. So just getting your mindset around what it means to be in an orientation mode, a, a, a size mode. Uh, the other thing is if you're starting new applications or you're thinking about a next generation application, make sure you're thinking about, you're probably gonna want it to have a mobile version at some point in time, or maybe it's mobile first and desktop second. So things like the size of buttons, right? 40 pixels by 40 pixels minimum, because some of us have fatter fingers. We aren't gonna use a stylus that we carry around to tap little check boxes and little buttons and so on. So again, think about mobile first. Think about the, the interactions the users are gonna do most and make those as simple as possible on the device and right up in front. Right? That's the main form or the main tab that you see first. Use gestures to move between tabs or click on the tabs at the bottom. So just, what are the high-valued interactions? And make sure those are the best as possible. This one, don't let stuff get between your app and the operating system and the hardware. We learned that in, in the beginning of the PC era, in the beginning of the, the, the uh, the IBM PC, the Apple, and so on. Don't let anything, if possible, get between you and the machine. Now, if you choose to, that's fine. Just be aware of that might affect the user experience or the latency of the interaction. And again, my world, build native code apps all the time. You can always choose to build different apps for different platforms, different code. And if you're Facebook or Google or Apple or some big company, with lots of money and lots of programmers, you might be able to do that. If you're a small practitioner, uh, you may not want to have to rewrite the same application over and over and over again. Security, well, you know, we're on a machine inside of our own firewall. Uh, there might be a different story. We can do a lot of things. We may have to obfuscate some of the data so the developers can't see social security numbers, credit card numbers, and so on. There might be things. You might hide everything behind some black box interface, stored procedure, or whatever. The developers at ADP, uh, they build the apps, but they don't do anything with the database. They call stored procedures and interfaces to do things, and somebody else in a different secure part of the world deals with that, right? So your device, you're gonna store some data on the device. How do you encrypt it? Well, these devices, iOS and Android, come with SQLite built into the operating system, right? Four data types, lock the table, no encryption. So you store some customer data in SQLite or in memory or in some other kind of local file. How secure is it? Uh, it seems like we're, they're trying to secure the device more, but then somebody figures out how to get around the security to the device itself. So of course, you can remotely wipe it and so on. And then the data that's transferring, when we're on an in-house network with uh, Wi-Fi, we don't think about what's going on, but if we're sending it over the air, you know, everything HTTP, encrypted, packets, and so on. So security is also has to be in this mobile and device space. Some of it's built in, you know, encrypted uh, RF as it's being sent between the box and the device so people can't just go down the road opening up the front doors. So. 
Last couple minutes, some of the demos I've been showing you uh, are built with our XE5 product. This is my little plug, Embarcadero. Um, their native code uses our Delphi Object Pascal language, and we can do all sorts of things with them, like uh, let's go over to this one on, uh, on the Samsung and uh, bring up an app that's... Uh, sometimes I... Let's see where I put that one. Okay, location. So here's an app. This app uses uh, a non-visual control that wraps the location, the GPS sensor, and then it has a web uh, visual display area at the bottom that, uh, that we'll call Google Maps once we get the latitude and longitude from the location sensor. So hopefully this will work in here, I hope. Sometimes it takes a little while before the GPS comes in. Sometimes it doesn't work inside at all. Um, well, yeah. See, this is why it's a live demo and anything can happen. Let's switch over to, to this one and let's try it over here on this machine. Let's run this. Uh, if we come over to the Mac, yeah. So here uh, I've got code, uh, the same user interface. I can decide to compile it for Android, iOS. I can even compile it for Windows if I want. Uh, let's go and run this on the device. So we'll hit run, and then it'll compile and link. It'll build the app bundle, and it will package it up and ship it through the USB cable for USB debugging. I could up send it up to the store if I wanted to as well, do an ad hoc deploy. Let's go uh, back to the device. Okay. Let's quit that and come back. And I'll turn on AirPlay again as soon as, okay, there's AirPlay, there's the device, here we go. And uh, somewhere in here, location app will be loaded. And so, again, a component that wraps the GPS, a uh, couple lines of code, and sure. And of course the warning, there's the latitude and longitude, and then it'll go to Google Maps and bring the page back to say, hopefully this will tell us we're in the Santa Clara Convention Center area, I hope, eventually. Here it comes. Or not. Well, it's a demo again. All right. It'll probably show up over there. It's just Google Maps and it's going to display here in a moment, maybe. Oh, it's probably doing a. Oh, you can't click there, David. Every time I do that, I got to put $20 in a thing at home. When I click on the screen rather than the device. So it was just refreshing the GPS over and over again. So it looks like near Great America Parkway in Santa Clara is where we are. And that seems to be close enough. Now, the nice thing, that share sheet application was two lines of code to be able to take the picture from the camera, use the picture, and pass it along to whatever app the share sheet end user chose, whether it was Facebook, Twitter, or whatever. That's not bad. Two lines of code, native code compiled for iOS and for Android. Uh, this one was probably a little bit more uh, in code. Maybe it was 10 lines of code. Uh, I always say that if, you, if it's more than 10 lines of code, then hire a real programmer. If it takes more than 10 minutes, that's not me either. So, so here we have our own framework where we wrap the native controls and the native APIs called FM application fr platform. You write one code in Delphi or later this year in C++ and you compile it for Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. And next year for Windows Phone, WinRT. Uh, it can connect to everything you've got, databases, SQL databases, it can connect local databases, devices on the thing. Uh, it can connect to the cloud through REST services. We have a set of REST service components. So if you want to get at uh, something that's running out in the world, Dropbox or whatever it might be, uh, that's three components for doing the authentication, connection, and passing commands to the REST service, whatever it might be. We did a survey earlier this year with a research firm in the UK. We had 1,337 Windows developers reply, and we asked them different questions. You can use the short URL to get the complete survey and results. Uh, that's at the bottom. 
And of course, it's not surprising that mobile is at the, at the center of everything that developers are thinking about, at least adding to their Windows world or to their server world. Uh, some of them have cho tried HTML5 and JavaScript and said that's challenging at best, so they've moved on. For me, the summary is, while I turn on a couple other devices, because it wouldn't be a device palooza without, uh, let me, I have to do two things here. I have to go over to my Mac, and I have to turn on a different access point there. And same thing over here. And that one's already connected, it looks like, so that's okay. And then go over here and run this guy. And, oh, I have to turn on AirPlay again. Come on. All right. Um, let's turn on AirPlay. And that should be on. Here it is. There's AirPlay so we can see. Samwise Gamgee is the name of this computer. It's Frodo's sidekick. And, and uh, you know, yeah, well. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get, okay, this is fine. And let's go and bring this up and go here and, uh, uh, sure, open. And, yeah, sure, that's fine. Okay, we'll go here and share your videos. Okay, so what this is, is is I've got an app that's programmed to do some stuff, and what it does is it, uh, it controls this uh, AR Drone 2 from Parrot, and there you all are. I'm not gonna fly it out over the audience because it, that gets dangerous sometimes, and I'm not a very good pilot. Um, and you should be able to see on the screen, oh, it's coming your way, I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's because I should leave it here. It also uses the, the uh, gesture and orientation sensor. Let's have it come back and down. There you are, and uh-oh. Uh, okay, and then wherever we do that, uh, then when it gets really bad, we'll land it right there. So. So the great thing is most of the successful devices that are out there available today, they're app ready. You can program them, you've got APIs, you can use different languages. I got really close, I'm sorry. There's also emergency stop, which stops, which stops all four of the propellers. I was almost ready to hit emergency stop. The second thing, it's great that all the service integrations that are out there in the world support HTTP REST and JSON. That's like, that's like the candy store, you know, it's Willy Wonka, it's like you've got everything you ever wanted and you can get at it and you can use your languages and your tools to get to it. And finally, all of us, you, the developers, we're at the center of this universe. We, without us to build this, these apps and those apps and those apps and use those devices, no one would care about the, well, we'd still probably fly the AR drone. That's running Android. It's its own access point. So I just have to connect to it as an access point, and then I can send commands to it. Now it's funny, the API, <laughs> maybe it's funny to me, I'm not sure. The API, you send character strings, and the first two characters are AT. If you remember your Hayes modems from the early days of computing, you sent AT something to get its attention. So maybe they did that in homage to, to the Hayes modem, but it's AT and then parameters. Uh, that you can send to the device to get it to do things, like not hit people. Uh, it's got two cameras, two HD cameras, one facing down, one facing forward. Uh, it can detect objects. It can, uh, there's a GPS plug-in, so you can do uh, nice flybys in a continuous motion. I use mine to see if my uh, gutters are full on my roof and see if there's any debris on my roof, so I don't have to get the ladder out until I need to. So I fly the thing over and use the downward facing camera. Oh well, okay. So again, you're at the center of this universe. You're gonna be here for years to come. When people ask me what's gonna happen over the next five years, it's more devices, 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 and services. So much so that even Microsoft changed their homepage on the keynote at Build 2013. On that day, Microsoft.com, if you look at the title bar or you do view source, Microsoft at home, devices and services. Even Microsoft, devices and services. 
So I'm the kid in the candy store as a developer. I get to play with all this stuff and I get paid to do it. And at the same time, I can program all these things. What could be better in life? Oh, making money, okay. Well, you know, you can make money selling software to people through the stores, through your own website, uh, well, except through iOS where you have to go through the, the Apple Store, right? Unless you do ad hoc deploy. So my time is up, unfortunately, and I know we got started a little late, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Joe because I've lost track of everything that I'm doing. I wanna thank you all very much for letting me come in. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away.